For the ladies of Wentworth Detention Center, there are moments of anguish. She's your niece. Pam, you're her last chance. And moments of drama. Please go away. I just want to be left alone. There's the tough. You make me sick. And the weak. Prisoner Cell Block H. Late Saturday, Sunday and Monday on Central. This week, First Tuesday presents a special report on the Guildford Four. Free to speak, Tuesday night at 10.35, here on Central. Can Kerr really know how to make a great cup of coffee? real coffee drinkers go out of their way for Kenko. Some of our guests here have traveled... Herbert Shaw's success as an after-dinner speaker meant he had to buy a word processor. He chose an Amstrad PCW9512. He can edit his speeches as he writes them. It will even check his spelling. But the most useful part is the free sheet feeder, which prints up to 30 pages at a time. So instead of printing out a short speech, he can just as easily print out a long one. Which brings me to my second point this evening. The Amstrad PCW9512 with free sheet feeder prints page after page after page after page. It's no good turning on the waterworks after November 15th. Register by then, or you'll miss out on the extras you could get if you become an H2 owner. To register for incentives and a prospectus and the water share offers, call 0272 272 272, no later than November 15th. Many Central viewers aren't interested in what Bob Warman and Michelle Newman have to say about the news. In fact, the chances are they rarely see them. They're not bothered that the latest technology and expertise help put them on air. But not to worry, Bob and Michelle, the people of Central West love watching you because they know that their news always comes first. In fact, with almost 10 million people for Central to reach, we'd find it a little hard to please everyone if we didn't have Central News West, East and South. Central News, we've got you all covered. Tonight's Their Life on Your Screen movie tells the story of Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. With Jacqueline Smith playing the title role, the film begins when Jackie is a child and ends on that fateful day in Dallas. That's tonight at 12.20 on Central. The news from ITM. Lawson says Mrs. Thatcher clearly knew why he resigned. Four would-be spacemen, one will be Britain's first cosmonaut. More refugees pour into the West, 15,000 this weekend. And the Prince of Wales on architecture of the Oriental kind. Good evening. Nigel Lawson appeared on television today for the first time since resigning as Chancellor and ran into conflict with Mrs Thatcher over what was said during the private meetings they had about his resignation. He said he had made it absolutely clear and categoric that he was going because Mrs. Thatcher refused to dismiss Sir Alan Walters as her economic advisor. But the Prime Minister has said that she didn't know if sacking Sir Alan would have kept her Chancellor. Mr. Lawson also revealed that he gave her until Christmas to get rid of her advisor because his public statements had created a running sore. 
Mr. Lawson arrived at LWT Studios a week after Mrs. Thatcher's big TV interview to give his version of his resignation over what he called the Alan Walters problem. He said he told Mrs. Thatcher that her economic advisor had been undermining his policies and causing confusion in the city. When the markets hear two different voices, because they think, maybe wrongly, maybe wrongly, but they think that the views expressed by Alan Walters are the views of the Prime Minister, there, are, there is I unclear direction of government policy. Who do we believe? And this was going to be a running sore a continuing problem for the government uh, as far ahead as one could see. And I thought it was in the interest of the government, therefore, that that should come to an end. Mr Lawson said he'd ask not for Sir Alan to be dismissed immediately, but by the end of the year. Mrs Thatcher refused. Mr Lawson was asked about Mrs Thatcher's comments in last week's ITV interview about why he resigned. Do you deny that Nigel would have stayed if you had sacked Professor Alan Walters? I don't know. You never even know. thought to ask him that. I, that is not... I don't know. I've been puzzling about that. I was uh, surprised. I watched the program. I was surprised when she said that, and I've been uh, racking my brains, and the only conclusion that I can come to is that she found it impossible to believe that I meant it. Mr. Lawson stressed he'd warned Mrs. Thatcher a year ago that Sir Alan's appointment would cause problems. Today, he added that her other advisers were undermining ministers. It's not just to the fury of the ministers, but it is also, in my opinion, to the detriment of good government. Labour were quick to point out the difference between Mr. Lawson's and Mrs. Thatcher's versions of events. I think he's blown her cover completely, uh, and I think it shows that the Prime Minister was highly economical with the truth in the interview which she gave last week, and I think she should now clarify matters immediately. If there is a direct conflict of evidence, I know which one I would choose. I choose Prime Minister's. What I expect happened, which so often does in this kind of situation, I expect it was a misunderstanding. Other Tories were more sympathetic to Mr Lawson's dilemma. Alan Walters in, was in the same position as a civil servant, senior civil servant, and really shouldn't be making public utterances. Sir Alan was playing tennis near his home in Washington when Mr Lawson gave his interview, but he wasn't prepared to talk about it. Mrs Thatcher arrived back in Downing Street tonight from Chequers. Officials said she didn't watch the Lawson interview, but was told of its contents and had nothing further to add. John Draper, ITN, Downing Street. A woman food scientist and a Falklands War veteran are among the final four candidates to go into space in two years' time. Project Juno, the Anglo-Soviet space mission exclusively covered by ITN and ITV, now has to choose one of the four to become Britain's first cosmonaut. It could be Royal Naval Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Gordon Brooks, a 33-year-old married man who served in the Falklands, or Army Air Corps Major Timothy Mace, also 33 and single. Food scientist Helen Sharman, age 26, or aerospace lecturer Clive Smith, who's 27. They've beaten 13,000 rivals to get this far, all replying to press adverts, astronauts wanted, no experience necessary. Gordon Brooks is the only dad. He says his children aren't overly impressed with his achievement, but when he was 10, he pretended to be a rocket and yearned to be a spaceman. He wrote to the Minister of Aviation asking whether I could be sent into space, and they wrote me back a letter saying, well, it's probably a bit too dangerous for 10-year-old boys, but in due course, maybe the opportunity would come about. And well, here it is. Helen Sharman is a scientist with a confectionery firm and is getting used to jokes about the woman from Mars. But she's still not sure about the recipe for the right stuff. I know we have to be fit, we have to be able to learn the Russian language. We have to be able to be practicing scientists, fairly dexter dexterous manually. But yeah, I think I've got it. Major Tim Mace is already swatting up on his Russian language. I'm really looking forward to the training and the chance of a trip in space because it's unique in this instance. Uh, no Briton has ever been into space before. Clive Smith, now in strict training, thinks the Juno mission is important for Britain. This will give space a much higher profile with the public who, who will then uh, see the worth of space and therefore be enthusiastic about funding new ventures in space. All four now travel to Moscow for final tests before just one is chosen to be the first Briton in space. Parliamentary deputies in Lebanon have elected a new leader. The 57 deputies unanimously selected the Christian René Mouawad as their new president at a meeting at Clayat in North Lebanon. 
The deputies also adopted the Arab League-sponsored peace accord to end the civil war in Lebanon. After the vote, the Christian Army General President Michel Aoun declared the whole meeting null and void. The East German government said tonight that it was going to relax foreign travel laws by giving passports to its citizens and visas for month-long trips abroad. But despite the continuing promises of reform, record numbers of refugees left this weekend. Since Friday, more than 15,000 have travelled via Czechoslovakia to the west after the unexpected lifting of border restrictions. The Communist Party chief in Leipzig, seen of huge anti-government demonstrations, resigned today on health grounds. This is the shortcut East Germans are taking through Czechoslovakia to the west. Here at the border crossing south of Plauen, it's just a 12-mile drive through Czechoslovakia to the West German border. There is no faster way out of East Germany. All day, East German cars poured through a crossing point that normally is little used. But none would admit their true destination. This young man refused to say where he was going. And this carload of youngsters were equally evasive. Yeah. While this man insisted he was going just to Czechoslovakia. These families have driven hours through East Germany to reach this Czechoslovak crossing point. From here, it's just minutes to the West German border. Here, some East Germans had just abandoned their cars in the countryside and walked across the border, leaving locals stunned at the invasion of their village, which has suddenly become an escape route through the Iron Curtain to the West. Ian Glover James, ITN, on the East German border. On the Czech border with West Germany, long queues began to form early this morning. These East Germans had driven across just 50 miles of Czechoslovakia, a corridor linking the two Germanys. All day long they came, many in convoy, their destination the little border town of Heb, and an anxious wait to cross through the opening in the Iron Curtain that still hangs across the Czechoslovakian border. More East Germans are arriving here by the minutes, determined to take this opportunity to cross to the west, and the queues here are expected to grow throughout the night. Earlier, more East Germans left by train from Prague, these on scheduled services to West German cities. 1,400 of them stayed overnight at the West German Embassy. Now they're joining the 7,000 who left from here by train yesterday. At the Embassy, Red Cross workers have been helping in the clear-up operation. West German officials concerned that what's left of the makeshift accommodation of the last few nights could prove a health hazard are asking East Germans not to turn up here. It's no longer necessary, although they say they won't turn any refugees away and will help with transport to the West. Glenoglaza, ITN, Prague. Disruption of ambulance services around Britain is likely to worsen tomorrow as crews tighten restrictions on non-emergency cover. In London, ambulance crews are bracing themselves for a repeat of the dismissals which brought services to a virtual halt last month. The main union, UP, says that the government is once again preparing to call in the army. A dozen army ambulances on standby at Chelsea Barracks in London. If the emergency service breaks down next week, they'll be on the streets, manned by the Army Medical Corps. At bases throughout the country, about a thousand vehicles have been prepared. That's a fifth the number of regular ambulances. That's a recipe for disaster, say the unions. Emergency calls are going to take a, a lot longer to respond to. It will put people's lives at risk. Unnecessary pain and suffering will be caused. And all for what? A small increase in pay is all we're asking for. Reasonable treatment. From midnight tomorrow, 13,000 ambulance staff will answer emergencies only. That's just one call in seven. The employers say their pay will be used to fund taxis for non-emergency patients. Like the army, the police are again on standby. The prospect of conciliation talks seems remote. A church service has just started in London, which marks the latest stage in the fight for the ordination of women in the Church of England. The General Synod will be voting on the issue this week. After the service at which an American female priest will preach, there'll be a 24-hour vigil. For those backing the ordination of women in the Church of England, it's the start of a crucial week. Tonight's address by the Reverend Betty Bone Sheets, one of hundreds of Anglican women priests in America, will include a message of encouragement. Don't be afraid, no matter what happens, and do recognize that what is being done is of enormous importance. Later tonight, she may hold communion outside Lambeth Palace, as another American woman priest did in London 12 months ago. This time, it will herald the start of a 24-hour vigil.
The General Synod last year accepted the principle of the ordination of women, but this week it will debate the details and could throw the whole package out. Even if it's passed, there are many stages to go through before it becomes law, and opponents of the change are determined to stop it. This issue will carry on, sadly, because it deflects us all from what we're really here to do. Those taking part in tonight's activities arrived at St. Martin's in the Fields Church within the past half hour, and the service heralding the start of another bitterly divisive week in the life of the Church of England is now underway. Stuart Maester, ITN, Central London. Soccer and Everton have been trounced 6-2 by Graham Taylor's young Aston Villa side, who are now second from top in the first division. Gordon Cowan's opened Villa's account in the sixth minute. Oh, but in the moment, here's Cowan's free. He's got plan up alongside him. It's a goal! From a 25th minute free kick, Villa went 3-0 up. And in the second half, Villa went on tearing holes in Everton's defence. Gets it through to Platt. He's got another one. A brilliant goal again by David Platt. And finally, the Prince of Wales has been studying classical architecture of the Oriental kind on the Royal Tour of Indonesia. He paid a visit to the 1,000-year-old Buddhist temple at Boro Buddha in central Java. Prince Charles travelled to central Java to the 1,000-year-old Temple of Borobudur, the largest Buddhist monument in the world. The richly carved temple is still shrouded in mystery. Buried for many centuries under volcanic ash, no one knows who ordered its construction or how long it took to build. Recently restored by the Indonesian government, it offers a tantalising prospect for those who, like Prince Charles, reach the top. Legend has it that if your hand can reach the centre of this sacred stupa, you are blessed with enormous wealth. Here's where I get the short of my arm. <laughs> <laughs> then it was on to Jogjakarta, the regional capital, where he joined the Princess of Wales at the Kraton, the sumptuous palace of the Sultan. The region is famous for the richness of its handicrafts and its traditional performing arts. And this includes the gamelan, the Indonesian orchestral music described as the sound of moonlight and running water. And that's the news from ITN so far tonight. From all of us here at ITN, have a very good evening. I should put on an extra blanket tonight. It's going to be a very cold night. A widespread ground frost and air temperatures hovering around freezing, as you can see, zero to plus two, but certainly a widespread white frost on the ground and on the cars too. Apart from that, not too bad a night. Most places becoming dry. There's still some stubborn showers around at the moment, but sky is clearing and some fog patches forming towards the end of the night, so take care on the roads. Tomorrow, well, a reasonable sort of day. Quite a bit of sunshine around, I think, for most of us. A few showers still, especially in the north and one or two on the east coast too, but later in the day, cloud thickening over Northern Ireland, and you'll have some rain for tea time. Temperatures tomorrow, not too bad, really. A little warmer than today, around 11 in the south. That's 52. Up in the north, 8, a chilly 46. But at least there's some sunshine to start the day. Join Trish at lunchtime tomorrow, if you can. Until then, here's the summary.